Before they were introduced to the galactic stage, humanity was under the watch of two separate species. One that was honestly not very interested, but saw them more as pets, or basically like somebody would look at an ant colony. The other would work with the humans, or more accurately, they used humans to work and to also hide. In doing so, they used the humans to increase their standings. This very small species used the humans to build new engines and weapons in order to make themselves stronger. When we, the Edvix, the most powerful species, found out that the raids on our planets and colonies were coming from that direction, we struck out. Those that viewed the humans as pets did not interfere as they truly had no stake in the outcome. Those that were using the humans evacuated the system after they were informed about what we had just done. They were using the humans for plausible deniability, and had sent human contingents of ships to strike at us. Those pale bastards have zero tactical ability, and are even worse with strategic thinking. Don't even get me started on how useless they are in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. We tracked down the human fleet, which took several decades to accomplish, eventually finding an area in which they were hiding. The nebula was ripe with anomalies and made communications near impossible. Our forces wanted to know who or what these ships belonged to, as we had not figured it out at the time. These blocky, ugly, drab hulks of metal were alien to our forces. For a moment, our forces thought the intelligence was wrong, and they had simply stumbled on to a new species. That is, until they tried to get away. There is only one species in the galaxy that has engines like that. The telltale green light emanating from them as they activate the engines could not be missed on a bet. The ships all seemed to turn in different directions. In fact, they aimed at every single direction except for two, exactly towards us and away from something else. We are not ignorant. We are not foolish. When they sent themselves away using a type of system we had never seen before, our fleet commander decided to figure out what they could be running from. Searching for several days, they could not find any dangers that this alien fleet might be running from. It was strange. Even as these odd jump engines didn't leave a trace to follow. Eventually, it was decided to investigate the direction they were running from. If they were so advanced, what could be so dangerous that they have to avoid? Perhaps... It's the raiding party our forces were searching for. Slowly moving from sector to sector, the fleet methodically looked for danger. They found nothing except a very light pulse that seemed to come from a small probe. When our fleet sent out a ship to investigate, they lost the ship. The probe itself exploded with a massive amount of force. The resulting EMP forced the ship to go dark as debris punctured the hull. A lucky strike against the bridge vented the command, and with the power off and unable to get to the bridge, it was only a few hours of air left in the emergency tanks for those who hadn't had their compartments punctured. They and half of the crew suffocated before any aid could arrive. They couldn't save the ship as the coolant system had failed and the engines would reach critical mass in only two hours after the remainder of the crew was rescued. The rescue ship would be the only one to survive the entire fleet, though. All we have is scanner data and a few images. We watched on these videos as the battle began the moment those strange ships came out of their very odd jump pattern. Within moments, they began to target our ships with every weapon at their disposal. High-powered energy weapons, kinetic projectiles that were magnetically launched, chemically launched explosives guided and not different rapid-fire ballistic weapons, all of these firing as the strange ships rotated on their axis. 
This allowed their energy weapons to cool as fresh weapons entered the battle. Our ships are not so easily destroyed, however, as they turned their own weapons and began to give the aliens the fight they wanted. The battle itself lasted for only 13 minutes, and the losses on both sides were grievous. This alien battleship was the last of the alien vessels to cease its actions. In retrospect, our forces should have simply kept cutting it apart, but instead they moved closer to board it. The rescue ship itself was almost 50% returned to the fleet as it recorded the battle. As our main battlecruiser began to tether itself along the alien ship in order to stop its momentum, there was a massive flash of light as a supernova burst into view. It only took a moment to realize that the supernova was not natural. The alien ship had exploded, taking with it the entire Grand Fleet, save for the single frigate sent to recover a lost crew. This frigate returned home to the Advic homeworld and report its losses. Each of the crew members believed they would be hung by their entrails and their corpses paraded around the city, yet the recordings was enough to save their lives. After this, another much smaller group was sent to find out what those creatures had fought so hard to protect. What we found was not what we expected. Only one planet in the sector was inhabited. Point of fact, only one planet was even habitable. The third planet seemed to be almost 80% covered in liquid water. The rest seemed to be different colors of green and brown. From the look of it, we expected a semi-aquatic to full aquatic species since the majority of the manufactured buildings were near or next to the oceans or other bodies of water. The planet only had a few orbital devices around it. None were designed to stop even the weakest of ships. This was odd, but not nearly as odd as seeing those slinking, pale cowards rise all their ships out of hidden areas all over this planet and jump away with the same strange device we had seen before. We would have to steal it from them one day, but for now, there was a new species to investigate. Searching the planet, our sensors were having trouble as the massive spider's web of interconnected frequencies was difficult to penetrate and that's being kind. When we attempted to communicate by downloading the contents of their data net, our systems became overloaded with information in a matter of moments. We were forced to shut them down. And shutting this down, the command decided to simply broadcast on every possible brand, frequency and wave and output to inform the population that we are landing. We then waited one planetary rotation, which is customary, before making our way to the surface. Before our landing, we sent down a landing beacon to the surface to assure our safe arrival and, of course, to let the locals know where to grovel. When we landed, it was the peak of the day. The massive arid landmass should have been acceptable for our landing, yet the geology was not what we expected. Those minerals that we had believed to be solid rock were forced up and around us so much that our helmsmen were required to rely solely on their sensors to land. Once on the planet's surface, we checked the atmosphere. A bit light on oxygen, and rather thin actually, at least by galactic standards, yet still breathable if you don't move around much. That was not the shock though. The shock was when the internal dampering system shut down, which is standard once a ship turns off its engine. The sudden burst of near double our standard gravity sent most of us to the floor. I was still seated, thankfully, and now had a much difficulty in getting in a standing position. Eventually I did, and leaving the ship, our forces tried to fly, but found themselves face down on this hot sand. 
Looking around, there was nothing but rolling sand dunes in every direction and nothing else. In the center of the formation, the ships and the beacon was still active. So my question is, where are the locals? I did realize that this massive desert was not ideal, but we needed enough room to land our ships. As we wait, a few of our marines are able to take flight by getting on top of the ships and jumping off, though the gravity fights them the entire way even with the thinner air, as it does not allow them to fly easily without constantly flapping their wings. As the last one ends up crashing onto the sand, he actually gets up and screams, They're coming! In the distance, a massive amount of dust rises up as we can see ground-based vehicles approaching. They show up with many small vehicles and a few armed vehicles, each of them having very primitive weapons. As we look at the vehicles, we all stood in amazement. We kept having to stifle our laughter at the absurdity of these locals. A single local came up to speak. Our translator had many strange anomalies happen to it as it tried to figure out the language. Eventually, it worked and we invited it inside. But before we could talk, the locals began to screech to each other. In the distance, another cloud of dust approached, bringing with it a second group of these humans. And as we watched, the first group began to engage and fire on the second. Backing up into our ships, our marines took in a few injured locals. The medical staff will want a good look at them anyway. As the battle continued outside of the ship, as more and more groups arrived, the medical staff began to examine the locals. This is where they discovered something amazing. Every single one of the creatures had an immune system that was so robust that even our greatest biological weapons could hardly cause them to notice. I, along with the rest of the command staff, had this checked so many times that the locals were getting agitated, so much so that they began to get rather violent. It was decided that this planet was being used. The massive amounts of viral infections, pathogens, bacterial colonies proves that the locals are used as test subjects. As the battles raged around the ships, their ballistic weapons could not penetrate our ships, all weapons except a few. The actions show that this is a very tribal planet, which makes them very easy to be controlled, and that is when we realized. So we sent a message to our government about what we had found. The medical and science cast wanted complete insane, demanding a larger sample size. Once the decision was made, we followed their orders exactly. We are to harvest as many as possible and return with our samples. Another group will be sent to harvest more if necessary. Each group opened their compartments and their marines rushed out. The locals were surprised to notice our folks at first, but quickly returned to trying to destroy each other's tribes. From every direction, our forces charged out dodging projectiles and the odd chemical compound that seemed to burn at such a high rate of speed it might as well be an explosive. The noise from the projectile launchers was rather loud even inside the ship. I can only imagine at that point that our forces were going deaf from the sonic vibrations so loud that it would overload and break the internal structures of their auditory nerves. When it became clear that our forces were capturing locals of every tribe that arrived near our landing zone, every tribe turned their primitive weapons towards our marines. The weapons are crude, primitive, but effective. The larger the weapon, the more effective they are. Even the heavy exosuits of our worker class were unable to stop some of the projectiles from piercing clear through them. Our forces would use the stun functions as much as possible to collect undamaged specimens, yet they had to change tactics as they began to lose members of their units. Realizing the local tribes were all now engaging our forces, which I thought strangely odd. 
Why do they not just keep fighting with each other like any other specimens do? I didn't have time to think about it too much, as it was time to withdraw. Much heavier weapons were beginning to get close, and our ships are not rated for heavy atmospheric combat. As the last of our personnel are brought inside of the ships, most dragging either a wounded comrade or a stunned local, the doors are sealed and the engines begin their processes. The locals slowed down their rates of engagement but did not stop as the repulsor engines began to lift the ships from the surface, slowly re raise higher until everyone is told to fasten themselves to something. To my extreme discomfort, the weapon systems began to launch a barrage of explosive projectiles. This is usually done to clear a landing zone as the explosives are only pushed enough to clear the hull. I held on tight as the shockwave from the explosives shook the ship very, very violently. Without warning after that, the ship tilts its bow straight up and engages the main engines. I have only heard of this used to escape a hostile planet. When I demanded to know why the captain used this tactic, he explained that the cargo hull was now unable to be pressurized due to all the holes that the locals had punched through it with their weapons. Every captain in the group actually feared that it would only be a matter of time before the engine compartment would have been struck. Under the circumstances, such emergency measures are definitely warranted. Delivering the specimens to the medical cast was difficult as they did not want the guards to constantly keep stunning the specimens. Also, they did not want the guards to use chemical sedatives as that might ruin their experiments. These locals, we found, they called themselves human, were inherently violent. Given the slightest chance, they would viciously attack the guard, the researchers, the staff, hell, even each other. They also turned out to be incredibly strong, probably due to the high gravity of their planet. It took two guards on each appendage, three on the lower, just to hold them down, and even then, they would use their lower torso to thrash and or strike with their heads. Many guards would either become hesitant around the humans or simply refuse to deal with them altogether. While waiting to find out a solution to the problem, one was presented. After a certain amount of time, the humans would become just very lethargic. They would then begin to show signs that their bodies were unable to retain fluids. At first, we offered them some of the combination of chemicals that covers the majority of their planet. This was rejected violently. It was not long, though, before we discovered that the standard dihydrogen monoxide was what they required. This became the standard of control for these things, and it kept them from being violent. Containers of water became the incentive for those creatures to obey. That is, until they are led into the medical facility. Some of them begin to get agitated by the aroma. Others, with the sight of the equipment, yet seeing another human restricted onto an examination table would send one of them into a frenzy. This was much more so if they visually located one that was undergoing exploratory surgery, alive or dead, mattered not. The reaction was the same. I read over the reports, and what they found shocked me to the core. Even undernourished, the human body had amazing abilities to heal itself. The level of cellular regeneration was so beyond our own that it led our own scientists to speculate that with enough time and samples, they could duplicate this process around our own bodies meaning that we would not be as reliant on pharmaceuticals. The area of the body that made the researchers the most interested was the human liver. To their delight and horror, the human liver could regenerate from such a small portion that it was the most tested piece of human anatomy, even beating out the extremely efficient reproductive organs. 
Looking again at the liver, our scientists found that they could duplicate this process across the human body, not just ours. For that, they would need more specimens to make sure this works. A lot more. So plans were created to return to their planet and capture more. Yet this would take time, as we had already lost 38 cargo ships, 14 destroyers, 2 frigates, and a battleship. We needed to get many, many more ships, some of our biggest cargo holders for this. And of course, this would not go unnoticed, and the galactic community had some inquiries. At this point, the humans were a secret, but it is difficult at the best to keep something like this quiet. There are already rumors about the main battle fleet being annihilated by the weakest spacefaring race. With all the remaining species starting to look at us with desire of conquest in their eyes, I may have accidentally released information about a random supernova and how new detection systems were being implanted, stating how no one wants to see their fleet lost. Although I kept the point that they don't want to see the fleet lost because of an enemy again either. We did attempt to call for the subjugation of the scrawnies we believed were responsible for this, yet they simply asked us for proof. Proof we didn't have or refused to show, hint hint. During this trial, it came forth that a new species had been found under the bylaws of the Charter. We were required to relinquish the bodies of the humans. When proof was shown that we actually had live humans as well, we were unfortunately forced to share or else face off against all the other species. A species known as the Shink, that looks like a cross between an arachnid and a crustacean, standing about three meters tall at its highest point, were the first to return with their examination of the human species, with a call to immediately begin harvesting humans. When asked, why are you in such haste? The Shink ambassador informed everyone that the nutrient density of the human, since a readily available source of protein is difficult to maintain in their sector, that a protein source that is so dense that only a single mouthful could sustain an adult Shink for six planetary rotations could not be overlooked. Next to insist on harvesting was the lake, a more humanoid species with multiple tendrils that extended out of their torso on either side. The lake had to speak through a translator as its vocal cords only function inside standard dihydrogen monoxide. They insisted that the human's internal nervous systems is not only a potent recreational narcotic, but may hold the key to fixing their species issue with nerve degeneration. For the lake, fixing this would be the same, if not greater, of a medical breakthrough than stopping all cancers forever. The Lepmok, another avian species like us, though they look very similar to humans with wings protruding from their backs, the feathers also covered 40% of their bodies instead of 90 like us. Disgusting. They also wanted humans, but just for their blood. Reasons being is they have found a way to clone themselves, but have fallen prey to cellular degeneration. With two complete blood transfusions, almost like changing the oil on a car, they would be able to bring the degeneration to an almost complete stop. Though other species disagreed with this course of action, the 4-3 to three vote allowed harvesting to actually occur. Before the council adjourned, a small voice was raised. A bald, pale figure stood to be recognized. A word of warning to those of you that have the inclination to harvest humans. Don't. The figure sat down, and they did not have the voice nor the votes to sway the council, so why try? Since they had already prepared for months, the advics are the first ones to begin their harvesting missions. On the way through the system, the advics receive 
a whole mesh of electronic noise that they have to turn the receivers off because of. This is to let the computers process the information they have, but it's going to take years, if not decades, to filter through that much. There is so much that the computers in the territory are still trying to decipher or decode what they're receiving for the first time as they entered the sector. Landing on the same continent, this time they will be spreading their ships out. One group would be heading north of the massive desert, yet not near the massive fjord. The second would be to the south of the large arid lands, while still inside the savannah. The third would land on the southern half of the continent, on the edge of the desert and savannah regions. Each of these areas was chosen for easy landing of their mostly flat areas. The large ship, ranging from the smallest at 450 meters to approximately 3.7 kilometers long, could not land close to each other, so they need a lot of space. On their way to the surface, the center force would land first. To their surprise, the humans had been able to build a few VTOL machines. They tried to engage the Advic ships, but their limited range made the human vessels very easy to strike. With the limited numbers of human resistance, the Advic continued their advance, landing east to west across the continent in order to maximize their efficiency. The Advic Space Marines began their assault. The 280,000 Advics per ship moved across the continents in a march to the sea on either side of the continents. The humans that surrendered were simply taken in groups. Those that fought bloodied the Advics, but were overrun by sheer firepower and numbers. The only humans to get away ran south into the dense flora that the Advics just could not follow. Those that run would find out that the Advics have no issue shooting someone in the back, though. Those that were injured or killed were harvested on the spot. The Advics didn't know the cameras recording the act of them using their talons to rip open the chest cavity, crack apart the rib cage, and remove the liver while the human still screamed in pain. The liver was then carefully placed in a container for transport. Even in the city, towns, villages, and tribes even, the Advic stormed across the landscape. From the oldest to the youngest, none were spared as the entire region was wiped clean of human life. The rest of the fauna was either too small, too fast, or too dangerous to harvest, as many of the Advics fell victim to the fauna that seemed to appear out of the ether and strike with such force that the marines had no chance of survival. If it didn't crush, it clawed. If it didn't claw, it bites. And if it didn't bite, it at least poisoned. All they could think of is, what the fuck kind of death world did we arrive on? The other two insertions found their own issues, even on top of the same issues that was happening with the center force. In the south, massive bands of fairly well-armed humans made their march to the east, west, and south very difficult for our forces. This is when losses began to mount to the point that the large ships would raise up and move closer to population centers just to engage with their ship-based weapons. Even with all the resistance, the southern force was still hell-bent on harvesting every human liver on that end of the continent. Metropolitan areas actually aided the Advics as we used the taller buildings to take flight. With both the center and southern forces genociding their sectors of the continent, one would expect the northern force to only have to deal with the same, well, yes and no. As they moved from the edge of the desert north, they found more and more resistance, nothing that they couldn't handle as they pushed all the way to the coast. Within 39 hours it took for the Advics to reach the giant fjord, the sea itself had begun filling up with a whole bunch of floating metal. When the Advics began to engage the boats trying to flee, the floating metal was joined by an atmospheric aircraft from across the sea. 
The amount of ordnance that suddenly burst from those ships shocked the Advic forces. As the missiles filled the air, they had no idea what was heading their way. The projectile launchers on the decks began to rapid fire into the Advic line, causing massive panic. Many Advics tried desperately to reach their transports with their prizes of millions of fresh human livers, only to watch in horror as their transports are torn asunder from incoming missiles. Calling for the larger spacecraft to assist in the evacuation was the best and the worst call. Even with the destroyers and frigates running low on missiles, they still had enough to make evac nearly impossible. The Advic ships fired back, but the human ships began evasive maneuvers, making all their unguided munitions miss their target. Something on the human ships made it near impossible to get our targeted munitions to lock on. When they are used, it looks like some sort of strange arching laser destroys them. But how did the humans have an energy weapon that acts like ballistics? On the eastern flank of the northern force, it was so much worse. Behind the cover of the other atmospheric fighter and the cover of night, humans dropped in mass from large aircraft. Humans sent with only one purpose, to kill, period. Sporting far more musculature, these humans would come in and destroy any advics they found. Clearing an area, the VTOLs would bring in fresh supplies and larger weapons. These massive cannons did not need line of sight as the advics cannons did. Instead, they would strike once with deadly accuracy, almost as though it was a warning, before covering the top of the ship with explosives and penetrators. Even the deployment of our own VTOL fighter craft did not matter as the humans would launch their guided munitions from ranges far outside of our visual range. When one of the Advic frigates was struck enough times that it exploded on takeoff, the decision was made to leave this death world with just over 1.1 billion human livers, we should be able to complete the research. Leaving the planet, ground and air-based missiles continued to strike the northern force, causing another three ships to fall out of formation, two of which had catastrophic failures and crashing back into the planet, the third exploding as it barely reached 300 meters above ground level. Our cargo was sought after by every scientist in our species, and the results were promising once we could get them back. The Shink would arrive on Earth 29 days after the Advix invasion left the planet. The Shink cared not for any of the large, flat areas, as they're a semi-aquatic species. They also receive far too much electromagnetic noise from the planet. They arrived on a different continent from the Advix. Scanning, they found the largest population of humans on the planets and began their landing procedures from there. From the east side of a large peninsula and then spreading west and then north around the coastline, they splashed down into the ocean and brought their ships to the shore. To the surprise, they received resistance. Though the massive majority of humans attempted to escape, only having two legs made them exceptionally slow and captured easily by a shink. There was contact on the way to the surface, as from the ground were large explosives being chemically projected at their ships. When these struck, the shink would shudder as their exoskeleton could not block the shock wave. Many would fall over dead if their internals were turned into viscous goop from the explosion, the explosion that vibrated their molecules. This was not so much problem in the ship, but when they disembarked, that was something different. Rushing across the landscape, the shink scurried across the land in a giant flood of legs, claws, shells, and mandibles. 
just over 250,000 of their ground forces went across the land, ripping apart anyone they could find and ripping them out of their hiding places and carrying the humans screaming in fear to the holding containers full of live and dead humans. It mattered not. The handheld weapons of the humans proved nearly ineffectual against the Shink's exoskeleton. A few vulnerable spots are found and exploited, as like when a human fires at one of the four eye stocks. Though this is horrific, the only humans with the firepower to damage or kill a Shink were minuscule numbers in comparison to the general population. As they gathered humans, many of the Shinks would eat while they worked. Unable to bite through or chew human bones, they found tender areas to bite off. Areas of choice was the thigh, buttocks, abdomen, usually spilling the intestines, calf, upper arms for males, and the chest for females. Many times the shink would take a few bites before tossing it aside and moving on, leaving the human to scream in pain and flail on the ground before dying of shock or rapid blood loss. Whenever the Shink faced off against armored vehicles, they would attempt to get on top of it and tear it open with their powerful appendages. The only vehicles this did not work on were armed with very large cannons. Even if just perched on top of it, firing the cannon would cause the Shink to fall off as their internal structures had just liquefied from the burst of vibration. Many more forces had actually landed around the continent and were already stretched all the way to the north and east of the peninsula, and these were facing stiff resistance. Floating metal arrived from all sides as massive numbers of armored cannons roamed the main continent. Though their aim was random and inaccurate, the numbers were enough to make many of the shank rush clearing out the large concrete nests of humans. Once again, grabbing those inside the buildings and taking them away as they screamed in terror as this giant crab spider carried them off. The harvest, all in all, was going well if you don't count the spaceships being pummeled from beyond the horizon. Since the Shink fight up close, they have very little response when it comes to this. The Harvest had succeeded in securing over 2 billion humans after about 70 hours, living and dead. So much that the transports are at capacity. However, this is not what made the Shink run like scared little bitches. One of the birch ships began getting struck below the waterline. These strikes are powerful enough to rupture the hulls, flooding the ships. The Shink began to panic as they are strictly a freshwater species. Realizing the dangers, the forces were immediately recalled. As the ships try to leave, a sudden blinding light strikes on the east side of the peninsula. The resulting thermal strike followed by an EMP followed up by a horrific shockwave killed thousands of Shink as well as destroying a half a dozen of their ships which also began to explode as the heat caused the weapon systems, which were usually stowed during transit, to overload and cook off. Four of the six ships eventually exploded in gigantic fireballs that could be seen from the other side of the peninsula. When the ships began to lift off, those in the northeast section came under so much fire that two more ships had begun to fall. One crashing into a shipyard where a large ship full of petroleum exploded with enough force to blow the enemy ship in half. The other lost lateral control and flew directly east as it descended back towards the surface. The rest of the Shink fleet made it off planet, but not without battle scars and venting atmosphere. With nearly 1.5 billion humans taken, they believed that it was worth the sacrifice as this much condensed protein would save unknown numbers of their people. It would be another two months before the lake reached Earth. Just like the Shink, they chose a different continent to invade. 
they decided to steer away from the areas of the two previous species that had lost so many. Reaching across the ocean, the lake headed to the southern hemisphere. When they landed, they quickly realized that they would not be an easy victory as in a quick snatch and grab, as the main ship began to immediately sink into the muck and moist ground that it landed on. Spreading across the continent from five different landing sites, they too became a wave of bodies searching for their prey. Their tendrils allowed them to move through the dense foliage with ease and pouncing on their victims. Then wrapping the humans up made it easy to capture four to six humans before needing to return to the cage with their quarry. Surprising that the only resistance were humans with primitive slug throwers and slow-moving aircraft. Though both are effective, neither worked well enough as they didn't have the numbers. They quickly learned the easiest way to attack an armed human was done through ambush and wrapping the human in tendrils so they could not move and making sure that the weapon was moved away. Usually, they would then tighten around the arm and hold for several minutes, and when the color changed to blue, the weapon could easily be shook out of the human's grip. The aircraft weapons did not have enough damage output nor the numbers to be effective enough against the lake ships. This is considered a good thing, as clearing off the entire continent will take time due to the topography. The lake didn't worry about any ocean-borne attack, as their ships were located towards the center of the continent, stretching north to south in their formation. As they collected around 400 million, the lake began preparations to vacate the planet. They would not get away clean, though. On their sensors, a flight of large in-atmosphere aircraft were heading to their most northern ship, yet something was wrong. The sensor readings didn't calculate as signals would fade, slip in, disappear, fade again. It was like something was stepping in or jamming the system. They didn't know what it was. Most of the command thought that these were all just transports trying to get their people out. Yet many of them were moving far too fast to be transports. The Shink didn't realize as the first wave went overhead before they realized. The Shink radar had not registered the bombs dropping until the first ship was cracked like an egg. With that, the humans decided to make an omelet. Many of the large seemingly transport vessels had seemingly dropped something and then turned around from a very far distance. Then the sensors began to pick up multiple smaller ships on intercept. Then even more bombing was happening, even on ships that saw absolutely nothing on their sensors. The small contacts began closing in faster and faster and then crashing into multiple targets at once. The lake tried to lift off, but their command ship was somehow stuck in the mud, and as the rest of the lake scurried to their remaining ship, expecting evacuation, they found themselves under relentless bombing runs that would come in from multiple, nearly untouchable guided bombs, or strikes from a bomber they couldn't track, or a bomber that was so fast they could barely get a look at it before it dropped its payload as it came over the horizon. When the command ship finally freed itself, the lake had already lost almost 50% of their forces. Using an emergency booster system, they catapulted into space with a speed the previous two species had not shown. As they left the planet, they could see through the deep magnification humans being brought in to secure the ship still on the planet by either strange VTOLs or willingly using the high gravity of the planet to pull themselves to the surface only being kept aloft and from reaching terminal velocity by odd looking fabric. The Lepnot were the last to reach the earth to try and harvest. With limited options, they decided to land their forces directly north of where the lake had, basically claiming any human on the northern continent. Their plan was to land the ships in two columns stretching north to south. 
The northern forces reached all the way to the Arctic circles, and then they would stretch all the way down to the large gulf near the bottom of the continent. Seeing the majority of humans are clustered near the oceans, this plan would work, rationalizing that they would be able to trap the humans against the ocean and there would be no place for them to run to. The Lepnon, being one of the most frail as another avian species, wanted to attack in force. Hearing rumors of how vicious the humans can be, the Lepnot wanted to make this a very quick harvest. On the way down, the Lepnot were struck with a massive amount of in-atmosphere fighters, along with that ground-based missiles and other systems. The Lepnot began taking losses before their ships, the size of aircraft carriers and larger, much larger, made planet fall. At least three ships had to call for evacuation as they tumbled down. As the ships began to lose altitude faster and faster because of too much damage, they began to list as thousands of avians tried desperately to jump and get away, spreading their wings, believing they could simply glide to the surface, only to find out too late that the Earth's gravity made it feel like their bodies were more than twice as heavy and the thin air didn't help them out at all. Many would perish while crashing into the ground, fully exhausted from trying to fly. Those that did make it to the ground alive were far too tired to even move, yet if they had known the horrors heading their way, they would have preferred to dive into the dirt at terminal velocity. The ships tried desperately to shoot down the aircraft, but the automated systems couldn't figure out how to target them. Some aircraft could hardly be picked up on sensors until they fired and then it was too late. Some moved so fast and were so nimble that the systems could barely hit them. Then they were calibrating for the speed, and then another group would come in so slow that the systems would miscalculate and fire far too early. Some aircraft even seemed to fly even though their wings had been shredded and their engines destroyed. And each of these craft insisted on getting close and spitting armor-piercing projectiles at insanely massive rates. With all this, the Letnaks still made it to the ground and flooded areas with their own marines and VTOL craft. They charged into large population centers and began capturing humans to take to the machines. These machines are used to harvest the human's blood, draining them in about 30 seconds. The process is quick, very painful, and horrifying to watch. Most humans had to be stunned in order to get them into the machine. They would regain consciousness just long enough to realize what was happening. The Lepnot had only been harvesting for about 26 and a half human hours before they had to recall all their forces. Priority was the human blood, and they protected it with their lives. It holds the key to solving their degeneration problem, yet getting it off-world with it is going to be difficult at best. Even though large cities are much easier to harvest, as there are many, 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 many more humans to be captured compared to those that resist, the smaller areas and the smaller populations seem much more difficult to harvest. Rushing past one of these communities, the Lepnok found many of their own fall to dissonic speed projectiles. The kinetic force was devastating to their bodies as they did have hollow bones being an avian species. The moment the blood was secured, the ships buttoned up, the command not willing to risk the ship or their prize over the lives of a few warriors. Looking at the formation of the Lepnok ships, it was clear that those in the southern end took the brunt of the humans' rage. Another seven ships failed to launch as the humans' armored vehicles, aided with the aircraft, with striking the ships with explosives that made the ship unable to pressurize itself. Even those that did not receive the brunt of the human vehicles found themselves being overrun with humans on all sides with all sorts of weapons. Any human that failed in their assault would immediately be harvested. However, the humans showing 
up with even larger and larger weapons over time on their own vehicles were not so easy to stop. Even with the ship's weapons, the humans would charge towards the ship to board it. Only one ship was successfully boarded and captured before the Lepnok bridge crew could even react. When this happened, all remaining Lepnok ships took off, leaving all others behind. And this is when the hunters became the hunted. The phrase the Lepnok didn't want to hear those that were left on the planet as they were hunted was, Here, birdie birdie. Here, birdie 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 as it meant that the human had found them and wanted to get their revenge. The ships that lifted off were harassed all the way past the stratosphere, with several million gallons of blood in their holds. The command only regretted losing the ships, not the personnel, as they had actually sacrificed themselves to most likely save their species. The council members all tried to downplay their losses and boast about how well they did harvesting human parts. Along with that, the results came pouring in every month and every year. Each of the four species had taken so much that they agreed to wait for the population of humanity to rebound before they returned to harvest any more. Within the next decade, the Lepna that had suffered the most paid heavily for the other three species to return and harvest more blood. The Advics and the Lake agreed, but the Shink wanted nothing to do with a species willing to radiate itself for victory. Approximately 22 years after the initial harvest, the Advics decided to land on the western sector of a large continent, while the Lake agreed to land in a more arid section in the center of the same continent. When the lake landed, then they found most of the population was either in small groups or in very large population centers. Facing surprisingly light resistance to the surface, they began to spread out in all directions. Being an arid region meant that they had to use their own tendrils on the sand in a way that made them look like giant spiders coming across in massive waves. Even those that tried to fight back found themselves completely overrun in numbers, clearing out every single human from the mountains to the north to the ocean to the south was easy until the warriors of humans began to send their chemically propelled explosives in mass. Those scurrying around on the ground were easy pickings for the aircraft, especially those heavily armed VTOLs that humans use. The losses were mounting up incredibly fast as the lake scurried back into their ships and left the planet. Though the casualties were high, it was a cakewalk compared to what the Advex had to deal with. Before the Advex could even get to the surface, the entire area came alive with aircraft, ground-based missiles, projectiles from all directions. They watched in horror as many of their ships tumbled to the surface the Advics may be an avian species, but they might as well be flightless birds in Earth's heavy gravity. Not a single ship landed intact, and it seemed like every military unit had arrived with insane amounts of weapons and ammo. The Advics are great at flying their own fighters. However, in Earth's very thin atmosphere, since the Advic fighters have very small wings, it makes them unable to maneuver in any reasonable rate on board the bridge of the ships. Their own readouts could not even count the losses fast enough as they fell onto the ground in hulks of flaming mass. Their standard tactic of flooding an area with their space marines was repulsed with massive amounts of explosives, bullets, and flammable material. Wings don't exactly work very well when they're on fire. It was less than an hour before the command of the Advics ordered a full retreat and withdrawal, yet it was too late for that. The extremely fast-moving bombers had arrived and ripped open the top of the command ship and several others like paint cans, and now they couldn't leave as they couldn't pressurize their own ships. 
within another planetary rotation. The command was desperately trying to ask for mercy as they're willing to surrender. One by one, the Advic ships fell victim to human forces dropping on top of the ships and using the openings from the bombardments and artillery to gain access. Humans may be a little smaller than the Advics, but they are far faster, stronger, more nimble, and are very, very angry. In the midst of the chaos, a single Advic ship was able to get off the ground and traverse enough of the planet to land and make necessary repairs. They returned to the Council screaming about how dangerous the humans are. This caused many of the members to confess that they had lost personnel and ships to the humans well beyond what they reported. For hours, they began to tell stories about how brutal the humans are, how strong, how fast, and how insistent they are at making sure their enemy was dead. In the midst of this, a single skinny creature rose up and looking at all of them with piercing eyes and said, We told you! And then turning and leaving the chamber to let them sit and stew in that. Earth and its sector would become a restricted area where only the most insane mercenaries would even think about treading to harvest. Some even just hunted humans, at least they thought for fun. This would actually allow the scientific community to continue with their research, finding even more and more to study with each new sample. That was until approximately 200 years since the first harvest. The species of the council were finding it harder and harder to attain any human parts, down to a single drop of human blood. The council species went back and forth on whether a harvest of humans was something they wanted to do again. The four main species claimed that the humans had certainly repopulated by now. The other members kept reminding them about the losses of personnel and equipment. Equipment that is still being replaced as it takes decades to build ships that are that large. As they went back around the subject again, each of the species received the same message at the same time. Over a dozen distress calls came in from every direction around the Soul Sector. The distress calls had stopped, but one message was clear. Every single call said the same thing. It's the humans! The humans are attacking! Send help! Only a few scouts were able to get close enough to the areas that had been hit to see the damage. The humans had arrived and killed everything before and after raising every structure to the ground. Looking at the carnage of all the dead species across the area, it struck a few of the council members so much that they vomited. It was clear that the humans did not come to take anything. Instead, they only came to destroy in the most brutal ways. The Advic council member, at least the one that wasn't spraying the floor with their breakfast, asked, Why, why would they do this? Once again, a pale, skinny form rose to speak. As he did, the Advic motioned to the recording and asked, Why? The pale creature, trying not to show his species' version of a smile, said, Because they are human, and they are very, very pissed off. From then on, the hunted became the hunters, as humans marched across the known universe, destroying any colony, world, or outpost that the four species had influence. Many tried to flee, but the humans turned out to be much faster, even their ships. They tried to fight, only to have their ships turned into floating hulks of twisted metal adrift in the ether. Others begged for mercy before finding out that the humans didn't have any left. Just like the harvested humans, the four main species lived the rest of their very short lives in agonizing pain. The fear of the human ships, even just one, was enough for many to faint, lose control of their bodily functions, or both. As the humans moved across to each target, a few items became clear. 
1. The ships used may have had some of their designs inspired by our ships, but were of much more grandiose design. A design of strict practicality to the profession of destruction. The armor, weapons, engines, and even their sensor arrays are perfected for war. Second, it is clear that the humans want to make this personal, as they would drop down to a planet and engage with their own no longer primitive ballistic weapons. Their forces are actually covered in weapons that can engage multiple targets simultaneously. In addition, they seem to love combustion as they will burn everything straight to the ground. As I sit here on a stealth transport, watching the humans lay waste to my homeworld, I can only take solace in knowing it wasn't all for nothing. Our research yielded results, making us all regenerators, at least those of us who are left. The shink population exploded with so much food at its disposal that it is a guarantee that a few of their numbers have been able to escape. The lake were able to fix the issue with their clonings by researching the human nervous system, given the fact that they can survive in space indefinitely due to their manufactured bodies. I would bet good credits that they are in the stars somewhere. The Lepnot cured themselves, but were also the first to truly recognize the threat. Small colonies were set up as survival shelters. They lost many, but not nearly the percentage that we have. Writing this, I have just received a shock. The humans did not kill our population on our homeworld. Instead, they just destroyed our infrastructure and anyone who stopped them. And now, they're leaving? We just received a broad spectrum message from the humans. They must have shut down everything else because this is not diluted with far too much electromagnetic noise. Before listening to it, I look up and I can see from the sensor data and with my own eyes, I can see that the humans are leaving. I am hesitant to listen to this message. It's a very short message, but I, I don't know. Oh, what do they have to say? Clicking on the message, everyone listens close to hear a human voice come across saying, Human hunting season is over.